Welcome folks who are just tuning in. We're uh, gonna take a few moments to let uh, all of our attendees get into the room before we get started. So just uh, hang out for a moment or two and we'll uh, dive into today's topic. Uh, if this is your first time attending one of our Zoom webinars, uh, if you have any questions, generally speaking, we do the questions at the end. Uh, please submit them through the Q&A portal. Uh, there's two places where you can talk here. There's a, a regular just kind of group chat and there's the Q&A portal. We ask that you send any questions relevant through the Q&A portal. Uh, that way we can check them off. Uh, if there's something extremely relevant to what I am currently talking about, uh, one of our uh, co-hosts, Manny Tejeda or uh, John Schlesinger will uh, ping me and let me know to try and answer that one right away. But typically we'll wait till about the 2.45 mark to dive in with the Q&A. Let's give folks another minute or three uh, before I start the presentation today. Uh, so we'll just bear with us for another moment. Thank you. All right, seems like the uh, trickle of new attendees has slowed down just a little, so I am actually going to get started. I want to say thank you everybody for attending. Welcome back for those that have joined us before, uh, and welcome to those that are joining us for the first time. Uh, my name is Anthony, I work at PhotoCare. I am a tech support specialist as well as sales representative. I handle all of our in-store Capture One trainings, and I've been running our Capture One bite-sized virtual learning series uh, since, uh, we've been in this new situation. Um, we actually started our bite-sized learning series in store as a way to present a uh, targeted bit of uh, knowledge information to our customers on focused topics. And once things changed uh, with our current situation and uh, what everything's going on in the world, we decided to make it a virtual learning series. So uh, we've been teaching Capture One trainings, we've been teaching uh, product demo, uh, demos and things like that. Um, and you can always check the PhotoCare events page to see what else we've got on the calendar. Uh, we generally speaking will update next week's around Wednesday, Thursday. So you may not see a whole lot up right now, but uh, trust me, we do have more stuff coming next week. We'll talk about that in a moment or two. But let's get started. We're going to talk about uh, editing night photography images today in Capture One. So <clears throat> what that means is we've got, we're going to have about half an hour of instruction. I'll do a little bit of slides and then I'll dive into Capture One with some hands on focus on a couple of images that uh, I have and show you uh, how to work on them. This is a more intermediate and advanced class because of some of the tools that we are talking about. It's a focus night photography image editing on one or two images. I've got two or four, uh, see how far we get. Uh, we're gonna talk about exposure levels, curves, HDR, color adjustments. We'll talk about layer masks, gradient masks, radial masks, and the advanced color editor, as well as some other things. Uh, the adjustment layer, which is the most important and one of the nicer features of Capture One, it allows you to make masks for targeted adjustment in certain areas. You can use uh, a brush to make a mask. You can make a radial gradient mask, so it's uh, elliptical or circular. Uh, there's also a, a, a gradient, a regular gradient, so darker at the top, and it gradates out. Uh, so we can make masks using that. We can also make masks based on uh, a selection of luminance values. So there's a lot of options for that in how to creatively edit and adjust and tweak your files and get the most out of your raw file. So uh, in order to find the layers, they are packaged under three sections. So in this uh, slide all the way over on the left hand side, uh, you'll notice it's the three circles. This is the color wheel. It would be the same thing under the histogram, which is the center slide. That's one that looks a little bit like a house. And then under the magnifying glass, the, the reason you can directly find the layers in these places is because most of the tools that you find under these tool tabs are going to, to, to support uh, being able to be worked on with adjustment layers. So once you create a new layer, if you see the tool that you wanna work with, has this little paintbrush icon on it. That's this right next to um, layers. It looks kind of like a carrot or their version of paintbrush. 
uh, that indicates that that tool can be worked individually on an adjustment layer. Certain things like ICC profile um, or the old vignette tool, uh, things like that that are kind of hard coded to the full image can't and they won't have that icon show up. So that's a good way to, to know. I can actually, when we get in the software, show that dynamically as well. So underneath the adjustment tool, let's take a minute to break this out. And if you've attended uh, either the, um, let me see, we did uh, two other ones on this before. If you've attended um, the, 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 the landscape um, or the architecture, we went over this, but I wanna reiterate it for those that weren't here before. This is our layers uh, tool uh, itself. And this is where we choose how it works. So right here, you'll notice that these headers are grayed out. It's because I haven't created a new layer yet. If I want to create a new layer, there's a plus button down here. Alternatively, if you want to delete a layer you just made, you would highlight that layer and hit the, the minus key. Because we're only on the background layer and you can't delete that, that's why this is also grayed out. If I want to make a new layer, I can either just quickly uh, click the plus button and it'll create a new empty layer, or if I hold down the plus, um, I have the options of an empty layer, a filled layer, a clone or a healing layer. Now those are specific layers built to do cloning or healing. I will readily admit right now that currently I am not using these tools because cloning and healing is far superior in Photoshop. However, uh, sneak peek, that's gonna change soon. Um, so you can create a filled layer. What that means is the whole thing is masked off. And the reason to create a filled layer is actually really important when I want to use the luminance range to make a mask. Uh, so if I want to use luminance range, what I would do is create a filled layer and then click the luma range button and I would change these sliders here to affect uh, whatever specific luminance value. It's theoretical right now because we're not looking at it. So once we get in, I'll explain it a little bit better. Uh, these also drop down and change. You'll notice once I actually have layers up, I have the ability to change them. So a little bit of explanation on what's going on here. Uh, once you do add a new layer, your opacity is no longer grayed out. You are able to change the opacity of that mask itself. This is where on the top level right here, this is where you would actually change it. And then it would dynamically show whatever we change that value to in this line right here. This icon uh, in the center uh, actually tells me that this is a regular adjustment layer and not a clone or a heal or even a luminance value um, layer. It's just a regular mask layer that I'm using for all the tools. Uh, if we scroll down a little bit further, we have different mask display options. I can either toggle it on or off by pushing this button. If I long press, it gives me other options. So I can change it to have a, a, a grayscale mask, never display the mask, only display the mask while I'm drawing it. It's up to you on how you wanna work. I can't tell you what's gonna be the best because everyone works a little bit differently. For me personally, I alternate between using display mask only when drawing or I toggle it on or off when I'm drawing. It depends. Uh, generally speaking, I toggle the mask itself on I paint it in and then I turn it off and do my adjustments. Right next to it, uh, this uh, little slider looking uh, icon here is our brush size options. And it's basically the exact same thing that you would expect to see in Photoshop. Uh, so when you hold, uh, when you click and press this, uh, you can change your size of the brush, the hardness of the brush, the opacity and the flow. I will readily admit, I leave the opacity at 100% always when I make my mask here in Capture One because I have the ability to change the mask's opacity after the fact. So if I've drawn it in and the adjustment's a little too much, I can dial down that opacity just with this slider. Um, so I typically will leave that. But flow, if I want to build it a little bit differently, um, I can change that. It all depends on how I'm working. Underneath, you have a few other options that are important. Uh, there's airbrush, which is kind of neat if you want to uh, build up a mask back before they made the new radial gradient. This was actually how I would make uh, vignettes that looked a little more naturally than the built-in default vignette tool. But now with the radial gradient, I don't really need it. So airbrush for me isn't one that I've used too much. Uh, pen pressure, if you are a Wacom tablet user and you like pen pressure for when you are drawing, absolutely by all means enable it. 
uh, auto mask is going to sense edge differentiation. And like, so if you have uh, a building in the sky and you turn on auto mask and slightly bleed over that building, it's actually going to sense that it's sky and you don't need to have that. We'll again, uh, jump in and show that a little bit later. You can also link your brush and eraser sizes. So when you toggle between the two of them, uh, they'll be the same size instead of whatever you left it off at last time, if that's something that's beneficial to you. And that's actually it for the slides that I have today. Uh, so let's actually jump right over to, um, to Capture One and we'll start here with some images. So what I've got uh, is a little before and after. So we can kind of start and look at this. Again, if you have any questions, please send them through the Q&A portal. And if they're uh, something that's extremely relevant, super important to address at that exact time, either uh, Manny or John Schlesinger will let me know and I will address them. If it's something that can actually answer quickly, they'll actually respond directly back to you. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump in. So this is an image I captured in Rochester, New York. This is High Falls. Uh, to the left is the Genesee Brewery. Uh, to the right would be uh, kind of where uh, Frontier Field, the, the, the baseball stadium is. Uh, the Kodak building is actually right side behind where we are. So uh, if you're familiar with Rochester, that's what we're looking at. This was actually captured with a uh, phase one medium format digital back. So it was an IQ 350 megapixel and uh, 80 millimeter lens. Uh, Kinda was just out one night with a friend, had the camera with me, decided to do a little bit of image making. Um, night photography is always a little bit tricky because generally speaking, you wanna expose to the right to have enough information in your shadows. But when you've got all these bright lights and especially with a waterfall, it's kinda tricky how far and which direction you push this. Because I am not an HDR type shooter, I don't do HDR bracketing. I try to get it as well as I can in one exposure. I was a little limited. I probably would have had a better end result with more detail in the water had I gone that route. Um, dynamic range out of medium format backs is amazing, but when you've got a dark to super bright scene like this, you're going to lose a little bit of something. I kind of compromise my highlights uh, in that regard. Uh, let me find out where my mouse went to. There we are. All right. So before and after here, this was the, the actual capture. And then this is where I was able to take this image upon editing. Uh, that said, I actually want to showcase something um, kind of important here before I get into my layers, which you can see all of them activated. So I did quite a bit of uh, minute image editing here. Uh, I want to actually slide down to the base characteristics underneath the color tab. And the reason I want to do this is this is actually an image that I created, I want to say, four or five years ago, maybe now. Um, and the reason I want to bring this up, because this is extremely relevant to the way the Capture One works, when I initially created this image and did the first round of editing on this image, um, I captured it using Capture One Eleven. Now, each new full version of Capture One, and occasionally for minute revisions, depends on how they've built out the software, the processing engine changes. And it changes by becoming more advanced and allowing uh, you to use newer tools, better math, better science. Uh, what the fine folks at Capture One's uh, you know, uh, software development team spend all that time working on. So technically right now, if I were to start working either on the file I've already captured or this new one, which is actually where we're going to start from. Um, I am actually right now limited to working in Capture 111 because the end, even though I have 20 open, Capture 111 is the process engine being used. So because I want to take advantage of the new math for the HDR sliders, uh, for the luminance value in um, our curves, I want to be able to take advantage of all of those new features that have come out since 11. I would actually just push the upgrade button because this is an older file. So I push upgrade and it asks me, do I want to change the engine? Yes, I do. I want it to become a version 20 engine so I can use all of those new version 20 tools. And uh, let's actually see if, so sorry, let me push that button. I'm gonna hit upgrade engine. So now my engine is, is upgraded. Now you're likely won't see a different in the images 
uh, in its far as tone, contrast, color, or saturation, because 11 to 20 is not that far of a jump. But if I were to go back and pull a file that I had edited in, let's say, Capture One Five or Capture One Seven and hadn't touched since, and I hit that button, you would see a drastic, not, I'm sorry, that's a little over exaggeration. You would see a noticeable change if you were paying attention to the shadow areas and the highlight areas. Uh, that's where they make the most leaps and gains with this kind of stuff. So uh, always go through, if you're working on an older image, make sure you upgrade it to the latest engine. That said, once you upgrade it to the latest engine, you can't then open this file in an older version of Capture One. So that is important uh, to know in case you are sending it to someone that doesn't have the latest version. Uh, there is no way to downgrade the engine once it's been upgraded, um, or at least not one that I am familiar with. Um, and also, you're better off using the latest version. It's got the best versions of everything. In it. That said, uh, oh, somebody's probably going to ask, so if you had a bulk of images that you wanted to do, just simply highlight all of them, come over to the button, hit upgrade engine, and it would upgrade all of them. Um, so it's, it's not a time consuming process. It happens very quickly. All right. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this image here and, um, we're going to, we're going to go through uh, a little bit of what I've done and then I'm going to show you how we do it. So I'm going to actually turn off on the completed version of this image, uh, all the little bits and pieces so we can kind of go through it and I'll show it to you. Um, uh, so first I took my regular image and I had my background, um, I had my background edit. So I brightened it up a little bit to kind of bring some of these shadow areas up. Uh, you can see that by being over here in the exposure tab on the left hand side. Um, gave it a little bit of exposure, gave it a little bit of contrast, and I gave it a bunch of saturation. I felt like this image, you know, with the, the lights, the water, it really needed that level of saturation to tell the story that I wanted to tell. Uh, I pulled down a little bit of um, my high dynamic range because again, we started here and we got to here just working on the base. So what I did with the exposure level, I'm toggling it on and off right now. Those are the overall changes to the whole image. And the, re the way I'm showing you this is I am holding down my option key and you'll see this little return arrow right here. That's our reset tool. So this will toggle it on and off if I hold down option and click. If I come up to the top of the page, up top up here and if I were to uh, hold down option this would show me everything I did to the base layer because there's different tools that I'm working on so the next round of things that I did other than the base exposure I also worked on the high dynamic range because when I pulled the base exposure up I started to lose a little bit of the water so I pulled down my highlight recovery I opened up my shadows because I wanted a little bit more information just in those shadows <laughs> I left the whites values alone, but if I wanted to see if I could pull more info out of that water, pull, pull more info back, I could try to start pulling that down. Same thing with my blacks. I actually wanted my shadows a little more open, but I wanted to keep my blacks black. So that exposure increase pulled my base level for my blacks up. So I decided to pull it down a little bit to bring those blacks back to a true black again. Um, I also pulled my highlights in on um, my levels, so I changed the point in which you know my my uh, what was to about 222 before is now going to be 255. Um, so I also took a luminance curve because with our curve tool, um, we have our regular RGB curve, which when I make an S curve or pull my center point up, uh, the RGB curve will affect saturation. And I didn't want to affect saturation with the curve. I only wanted to pull my luminance value up. So Capture One actually allows you to just pull luminance and not affect saturation contrast um, by just picking the luminance value. And I just pulled the, the mids up just a little. And that brought us to about here. Uh, I also added some clarity. Clarity is micro contrast. Uh, I chose punch because again, I wanted this to be more contrasty and more saturated and punch gives you the most amount of that. And I just slid it up about 20 points on the black, on the, on the, on the slider. So that got me to about where I am now. The only thing I want to check and I, cause I can't remember. 
So I didn't touch the white balance. So somehow my as shot daylight white balance gave me the proper white balance, even though I've got mixed light between moonlight, city light, LEDs, you know, uh, sodium vapors and tungsten. Uh, it gave me a pretty decent color balance. Uh, so off the bat, I didn't have to touch this. Now color balance, especially when we're talking about night, you've got multiple different, um, multiple different color temperatures going on. So even if you set it to one in your camera that's close, you may still get some strange results. We'll actually see that in the next one we're going to talk about. And color is subjective, so uh, worrying about a gray card here may or may not help you. Uh, finding the exact neutral point, again, may or, not, may or may not help you, but rely on your color numbers to tell you the story. Do your color numbers match what should be neutral in places that are neutral? Or are you creatively making it something that is no longer a neutral, properly color balanced images? That's going to help you tell your story. Um, so let's talk about the first thing that I did. Uh, we're going to go in order. First thing I did was add um, a mask for the falls. So here I actually painted this one in by hand. Um, sorry, was, I lost my uh, Wacom pen. <laughs> Uh, so here we go. Uh, so again, I'm just toggling my mask on and off with uh, the M key, which is the keyboard shortcut to toggle our mask on and off. Um, so I can see that I made a mask. I kind of blurred out the edges a little bit on the edge. I tried to paint it as close to the water as I could. And this was just all a manual process. And I mean, you'll notice down here how that mask doesn't go all the way to the edges. So if I wanted it to go to the edge and work out all the way to the water, I could simply just hit the keyboard shortcut uh, B for my brush and continue to paint this in, smooth this out, and do whatever I need to do. I could turn that off and see how it reaches over and, uh, and, and touches it. You'll see that it is currently calculating the auto mask. Um, it's trying to see if there was any kind of differentiation it needs to stay to. Uh, between where I painted and what's next to it. Um, generally speaking, it doesn't take that long to do an auto mask, but because I'm also trying to live stream to, to Zoom right now, uh, my what is this, 2017 MacBook Pro does slow down a little bit with tasks that generally speaking would not be slow for most of you with a modern, fast, higher end computer. Um, it's just Zoom that does that here for me. So I follow the mask and it enables me to make the edits that I needed to do. Uh, I will show you how to make uh, some of the other masks in a minute. This one is just pretty, pretty easy and straightforward uh, to just paint it in. Uh, if I wanted to, to, you know, we can talk, we're going to talk about exactly what I did just to this layer in a second. So uh, <clears throat> I decided with this mask that I needed to Looking at the image, I wanted the, the, the water to be a little bit darker, have a little bit more tone, but also have more saturation. So in order to do that, I first, uh, let me reset this completely and reset this completely. So I decided I wanted a little bit less exposure, but maybe a little bit of contrast and a bunch of saturation. Uh, because I like saturation and they have lights behind the waterfall. So it being able to pop and be saturated, this actually uh, matches much more closely uh, with the level of saturation to what my mind is telling me what this scene had looked like. Uh, same thing I want to do here. Do I want to pull my highlight recovery tool down a little bit to try and see how much of, of that water is actually holding any tone or detail for me? Uh, I can move my shadow slider around. Maybe it feels like when I pulled the exposure down too much, the water got a little too dark, so I can actually open my shadows here. I can try opening my blacks a little bit and see what that does to my color and how that makes the water feel. Uh, so I've got just a, a nice 100% mask on my falls, and I can, I can make those, those changes. Uh, I actually did not use any micro contrast here uh, via Clarity. Let's see actually if that does anything for us, it helps it, hurts it, doesn't do much. Uh, it definitely makes it feel a bit more crisp. And you'll notice that the, the differentiation between the highlight and the shadows really starts to separate a lot further. So this white's starting to get a lot more blown out. The blacks are starting to get blacker. 
it all depends on where I want to go uh, with that and making it look like a real, uh, a, a, a real scene <clears throat> and how I remember it. So the next, the next piece up I decided to do was the bridge. So I'm going to turn that on, turn my mask on. Again, this was quick, simple, grab my pen, hit the B button, and just paint this in. Uh, of course, you know, when I paint these things in, it really depends on how much overlap and bleed you want to have. This was actually kind of a quick hit on this one. So you'll notice I really was kind of going for the, the nice stonework that's down here and not necessarily so much uh, just the generic ugly uh, bridge uh, topping itself. Uh, so if I wanted to make it all uniform and nice, I could actually just um, come here, hit the E key for my, for my eraser, and I could pull it off the bridge because I don't necessarily want the bridge uh, brighter um, because, um, again, this is gonna happen, we're a little slower, I'm sorry. Um, uh, also I'm using a Wacom 3, the Intuos 3 on, uh, an operating system it's not really supported for, so every pen click doesn't always register. Uh, I need to pick up a new one for home use, so I gotta, gotta do that. But, uh, if it's slow or if it's, or if you notice it's not clicking when I'm trying to draw, those are the, those are the reasons for it. Uh, actually, there we go. There is... some reason it doesn't want to toggle out of being hang on bear with me for one moment i actually have to quick capture one sorry about that for whatever reason uh it's not capture one isn't allowing me to use my brush tool at the moment so i just need to restart capture one while it's a great piece of software sometimes things do get a little bit buggy i am still going to blame this on trying to do uh, capture one editing and uh, zoom at the same time. There we go. Sorry about that. All right, and we're back. All right, so we're on the bridge, turn my mask back on. And I want to pull it off of the bridge itself. And I realize I probably didn't hit the whole uh, brick part so I can paint that in. I'm actually going to turn auto mask off for today because just because I don't want this to slow us down and have that pop up every single time. Um, there we go. Just paint that in. There we go. So I've, I've got, I've got, you know, this roughed in about as, as much as I need it. Now, can you spend hours doing this? Sure. Uh, this image hasn't been printed. It hasn't been used for anything other than training. So I'm a little bit looser with my masking here because it's just been used for web or for this kind of stuff. You can get in and get as precise as you want to on these masks. Um, I've definitely spent time doing that. Uh, but all, all, all I really did here for the bridge uh, was about 18 points of exposure, and I pulled my shadows up. Um, now, if we look at this, though, if I turn my mask off, what happens every single time that you raise exposure, and especially if you raise uh, the shadow levels, is you're going to reduce contrast. So um, it may look a little bit flatter right now with these changes. So what I could do is I could still pull my blacks back a little bit so my absolute black values start to come back down to where they were, or I could add micro contrast back in. Uh, typically, I'll add some micro contrast back in with clarity to kind of just give it that same punch and feel that it should have had. So if you look at it right now and see it's a little bit flatter, it may be harder for you to see through Zoom, uh, but on my, my laptop screen here right now, uh, it definitely, presents nicer when I add that contrast back in. So anytime I'm doing that kind of uh, exposure lightning or shadow lightning, I want to either bring my blacks back down a few points or bring in more contrast so it doesn't feel flat. Uh, you'll notice that I have done that in other places in this image that I'll get to uh, momentarily. 
All right. So we're going to come over next to the sky layer. And I'm going to punch that. And this should have been. Oh, nope, this wasn't. Uh, what this, I think this actually started out life as a, a, a gradient mask and then i edited it and rasterized it so it's no longer able for me to be changed so what i'm actually going to do here is i'm going to clear this one completely and start over so as it is right now i feel like we've got so much dark at the bottom i need a little bit more dark at the top the sky is a little bit too bright for me it feels like we're just so heavily rooted down here and then it lightens up too much at the top so i'm going to bring my sky in and i've got a couple of choices on how i want to do that uh, I can uh, select my radial gradient tool, which is right down here underneath the layers, and I can start to drag this down. Sorry, not radial. This is just a regular gradient. Radial would be the circle or uh, elliptical. Um, and you'll notice as I start to pull this down, uh, this is going to be 100% opacity. This is going to be 50% opacity, and then this is like 50 to zero down here uh, pretty quick. Um, I, it's, it's going to you have the ability to change the spacing on that. So it's not always equidistant. So I can have much more of it be 50% and a much smaller portion be the, the 50 to 100. Uh, um, you know, uh, 50, 50 to 100 and then 50 to, to zero. So I, I have the ability to, to change the controls on that and have it be a little asymmetrical, whereas the radiant is always gonna be, uh, it's always gonna be symmetrical. Um, so I can pull this down, and I think what I had wound up doing, um, I can also uh, rotate it in case I didn't like where I pulled it. But what I wound up doing here is I wound up, um, you know, and you can move the whole thing. It, I don't want it to overlap into the building. I want to get most of the sky. Um, so I have the ability here to, to drag this, change it. And now when I toggle it off, you will see that um, it's really pretty dark up there uh, in that corner, but it doesn't have the same feel on this side. Um, so I've got maybe negative 115. That might be a little heavier than I needed. So if that went too far, uh, I can always come over to my opacity, start to drag that down and it changes the opacity of the mask as if I drew it with an 80% opacity instead of 100%. So I have that level of control. Yes, by all means, I could certainly not have it be, you know, a, 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 a stop point 15. Um, you know, I could change this as well. It depends on which way you want to work. Um, you have the ability to do either. <clears throat> so I've got that change in. I want to have my sky feel a little bit more uh, equidistant. Uh, I want the left-hand side of the sky to feel a little bit the same. You can only have one radial or gradient mask per layer. Uh, you can't have multiple. So if I want to have do the same thing on the other side, that's why I have sky two. Uh, a better name for it probably would have been left, or if I spell right, left. I like to be specific, same way in Photoshop, if I'm doing layers, I try to name them out so it all makes sense. And I know like what it is, where it is, and theoretically what it should be doing. Uh, so I've got my sky left and I can um, do the same thing here. This again was a gradient mask that for whatever reason I rasterized out. So you have the ability if you wanna make changes with a pen to draw, edit, erase, add, but if you do that, you actually are going to have to rasterize that mask. Um, and then you don't have the controls anymore. Whereas here, I can still change the actual gradient flow, but on this one, while it was originally created that way and then rasterized, I no longer have that control, which is why I'm just coming back in, clearing the mask, waiting for it to catch up. There we go. And now I can just draw a new one. And notice when I clear the mask that the adjustment values still stay the same. It's just not making a change because I haven't painted anything in yet. So here we go. I can pull that down. I can change its amount of fall off. I can pull it back, come closer to the center. I can do a little bit of rotation. It all depends on how I want to make that thing happen. Again, I can toggle it back off with the M key. 
dial down my uh, opacity if I want to control it that way. And I've got a sky now that starts to match the feel of the bottom of the image. It's a little bit darker, keeps you a little bit centered uh, in that image instead of floating off the top of the image. <clears throat> so now the buildings probably need a little bit of work, right? Uh, maybe I want to brighten them up. So what I could do again is come in, draw a quick, simple mask. Again, I just did a, a, a quick hand paint with the brush on this one. Um, drew it in, left out the things I didn't want to touch because obviously I don't want to make this white building brighter or this building brighter back here. Um, I just kind of want what's down in front. So now that I have those, uh, I can start to do the work that I need to on them. So part of that was bringing it up a third of a stop in my exposure over here. So let's actually toggle this on and off. So it was, I've got my mask painted in, and this is where I was at. And I want to make it brighter. I can either drag the slider till when I think it looks good, or I can simply click here and type in values. If I am not sure and I don't want to use the slider and I uh, toggle my mouse into this box and I use the up and down arrows, it'll go up a tenth at a time or down a tenth at a time. Um, so that's also another way to, to kind of micro step through is any of these fields that you click into, depending upon what the field is, will depend on what the numerical value it increases by. But you can always go up and down in micro steps used by clicking into the box and using the arrow keys. <clears throat> so maybe I want a little more contrast in here because like I said, uh, when you brighten something, I think that you should always um, add some more contrast back to it so it doesn't get flattened out. Uh, I wanna bring my highlights down because as you notice, uh, I didn't mask out these street lights and they're becoming a little too bright. So if I, you know, start to bring down my highlights, they won't be quite as punchy as they were. I mean, I could make them ridiculously blown out punchy if I wanted by going positive, or I could just maybe bring them down like negative 15 or whatever till they feel like they've got as much tone as they probably should have based on what the scene should look like. Uh, I also want to maybe bring my blacks down because I've brightened it uh, just a little, and I want to open my shadows a little bit. It sounds counterintuitive, but it really kind of works for me to help have the shadow areas not be so heavy, but keep my black numbers where I kind of want to have them. Um, again, I can also come in and add some punch to this if I felt like what I did with uh, changing my black levels and my contrast here wasn't enough, but I feel like this probably has enough contrast in it right now to balance it out and make it feel uh, nice and, 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 and working. Um, I, I go back and forth between whether or not I want that top section a little bit brighter because it feels heavy. So I actually did do a separate layer for just that. I still can't decide which version I like, whether it's heavier or slightly brighter. Um, that's one of the beauties or maybe uh, one of the problems of working digitally is how far you can continue to push things and see uh, where it winds up landing. So you can drive yourself a little bit crazy on that end. Uh, I also decided uh, with my background buildings, the lighter ones, what wound up happening is when I took my base background level exposure and brightened it, those bright buildings got a little bit too much. And now um, I chose them uh, based on, you know, the ones that are back here. I just, hand, again, hand painted these in. Um, because the luminance values in this image, actually, I'm gonna show you how to make a luminance value off of this one. So I'm gonna clear the mask and uh, let's see how close we can get with the luminance value. So I've cleared my mask, I have a layer. Let me actually uh, reset all of the changes too so we can start from, uh, from zero on that. And I wanna get this building, this one, this one, and these to be not exactly as bright because the brightening of the image before took them to a point that feels maybe a little less natural for me. So let me see if doing a luminance range will work for those background buildings. So what I can do, what I need to do is at first I create my layer and if I was starting from scratch, which I'm gonna do right now, 
uh, I'm gonna click and hold on that add new layer, but instead of doing an empty layer, I'm gonna do a filled layer. I'm gonna call this bright buildings because those are the ones I wanna to tone down. And now I'm gonna push the luminance uh, range tool. Actually, before I push that, uh, so if you see, I created this, should have created this as a filled layer. There we go. Uh, so when I toggle my mask on, you'll see that the mask takes the whole image. Uh, whereas, uh, if I push the luminance range button, automatically based on the pre-configured uh, range that the tool default has, you'll see some of this mask has already dropped out. Now I have the ability to bring the bright points up and change the background points. There is a lot of different roll off options, radius, sensitivity. This is all going to control how it uh, how it rolls off into the neighboring colors. Sometimes you're going to be perfectly fine to just leave it with the, the, the default amount of radius and sensitivity and how far out uh, the endpoint uh, kind of tapers off to. It really all comes down to, to, to what your choices are going to be um, and how you want to handle this one. So I want this to have a little bit more fall off of these buildings back here, a little bit more roll off to it, and I'm going to hit apply. Now, that said, with doing this, I've got a lot more than I want to have adjusted because I want my water to stay a little bit bright because it's going to be. And I maybe don't necessarily want to have these points in. So I'm going to take my pen. I'm going to take uh, my eraser. And actually, um, when I erase, I actually don't need to, to, to rasterize the mask. I only need to rasterize the mask if I wanted to add something in. So I'm going to show you how that all works. Uh, in a second. So I just want to, I'm going to do this kind of rough and quick just so we uh, don't run out of time here today. Uh, so I'm just going to hit all of these points and take these buildings out because I don't want to, I don't want to brighten these buildings that, uh, I mean, darken these buildings that I just brightened. Now, maybe the windows I could because it's not necessarily the brick that's bleeding in, but uh, it, it really all comes down to, to personal preference on that. So for now, I'm just showing you how we take these bits out. All right, so I've got my background building set and ready to go. All of that's been erased out. Uh, and now if I want to darken those buildings, I'm going to toggle it off because I need to have it off uh, in order to look at it. So if I want to bring the exposure down on just a few points, so that Hyatt in the background starts to look more natural uh, than where we were before. Same thing with uh, this building over here. And same thing with the, um, I think that's a hospital or some kind of health services building. If I start to bring these down, bring down my highlight recovery, you'll notice the name starts to look a little bit better, um, a little bit more readable. This, which was definitely pretty close to being blown out, um, is, de is de has more tone in it, more uh, uh, definition in it now. Again, I'm going to want to add some clarity back into this. Uh, just to give it a little bit more contrast. Um, it just gives it a nicer overall feel. Um, so those are, those are some of the ways to do that. If I decided I wanted to maybe darken down this area too, because that's really bright, because I'm already darkening things down, I could now grab my brush tool. I know I erased this out before, but I did it with a reason. Uh, I wanted to show you what happens when you try to brush something in to a luminance value. And right now, the sun, if we look at the layer itself, you'll notice that these are all regular adjustment layers. And this one has the sun on it, indicating it is a luminance range layer. And that's how we adjusted it. But once I try to do this, now what used to happen, oh, hey, let me paint it in. That's interesting. Uh, generally speaking, you have to rasterize the mask. So I don't know why this is working for me today. Uh, so that's weird. Um, 
those of you who have used uh, these tools have noticed this before also. Uh, I was hoping to show you how we had to rasterize the mask to make that change, but it's not doing it with a luminance value. They may have changed something. It definitely would do it with a gradient though. So if I were to come into my gradient, which is the left, so we've got our gradient, you can see that now. If I were to try and brush something in, now it wants me to rasterize it. So before luminance value needed that, uh, your gradients still absolutely will. They must have made a change that I didn't read about uh, in version 20 for uh, rasterizing masks. So I rasterized it. It's, uh, um, I, did, I actually didn't rasterize that one, but see what we've got going on. Uh, Manny, any questions? Anybody got anything that's relevant to what we're working on right now? Or I'll currently, just... currently, there are no questions. Okay, I'll just keep on keeping on. Uh, so I also took uh, a camera system. You'll have to pardon me. I don't remember which camera this one was. Uh, this was actually also a 50 megapixel camera that I brought uh, to this, um, to Sylvan Beach, which is up in um, the Finger Lakes region, kind of near Syracuse. It's an old time carnival fairgrounds with old rides, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, set up the camera, take a frame, and this is where we go. Uh, color temperature, again, is one of those things. If I wanted to look back at my metadata, apparently, um, I thought that this was going to be a, a, a tungsten image. If I look at my color profile, oh no, I had that as outdoor daylight. I'm sorry. Uh, so when I shot this image, I had it set my colors, my ICC profile in the digital back to outdoor daylight. And you'll see what outdoor daylight looked like um, as default through this image. Doesn't look right, doesn't look pleasing, actually doesn't look like a fun image, looks way too cold based on the lighting that we had. I certainly could come in and try and switch the color temperature to something else, the ICC profile, and see if it gets closer. But the realities on that, none of those are going to get it perfect because of the mixed lighting scenarios that we're in. So we've got a white balance regardless of what we're doing. And to do this, we've got to kind of figure out what the kind of overall feel we're going to go for is. Because again, this is one of those uh, not necessarily needing to be uh, accurate color temperature situations. Uh, so I believe I did with this, and you'll notice this image is the same thing. It was edited in version 11. I want to upgrade my engine. So I had already done this one, but not this one. Uh, I basically went from a color balance to 2760 as shot. This is what it thought white balance needed to be. And I actually just manually edited it. I changed it to, I grabbed my Kelvin slider and my tint wheel and uh, got it to somewhere that felt a lot better. Uh, could I have grabbed my white balance tool and started hunting and poking around to get to something that maybe should have been closer to neutral? Absolutely. You certainly have the ability to start uh, to, to, to do that. You can either uh, push and get close and then fine tune. It's generally what I do is I will, uh, click somewhere that I feel like would realistically be somewhat neutral and then fine tune tweak it to where I want it. Uh, so that allows you to kind of get the color in. I wanted way more magenta on this one than where we were at. Uh, it just gives it that feel, uh, that, that, that feel that I was looking for. Hey Anthony, we have a good question for the levels tool. Yes. Do you use the levels tool more than the highlight uh, slash shadow tool or vice versa? Uh, Paul, that is actually a great question. Um, I find I use both of them uh, quite frequently. Uh, I would say if we were talking about what do I use more, levels or curves, I use levels way more than curves. I want to control what my endpoints are, and that's where I control that bit. Um, and then I use the HDR tool for fine tune tweaking of either my black values, my shadow values, my white values, or my highlight values. Um, I use both in conjunction to fine tune and tweak the image, uh, but, but uh, both levels and curves. So I'll set my endpoints on my levels, then I'll work with HDR to bring it the rest of the way to where it needs to be. 
um, mostly through adjustment layers in targeted areas. <clears throat> so set color balance to what I feel uh, is, is about, um, about right. And then I'm also going to turn off all of these layers. All right, so now here we are on the background layer and we'll talk about what I did here first. Uh, so I felt like my highlights were really popped pretty hard. Um, well, they weren't yet. Uh, let me set this back. So. For my base exposure from where we were previously, I wanted to bring up my highlights, add contrast, add saturation. So I did that by bringing up my exposure about 0.44, 12 points of contrast, left the brightness, which is your mid-tone values, uh, left that alone, uh, and I brought my saturation up about 15 points. Then um, I just, you know, when I make that that whole change. Again, my highlights are too, too hot. The sky is too bright. Um, this in here is too bright. So I decided on my background layer to start to bring that down. And maybe I want it to be real heavy. Maybe I want my blacks to be even darker. Uh, I also wanted to brighten up uh, my endpoints. So I actually shifted my endpoint on background layer to 245. So anything that was 245, uh, is now 255. Anything that was above 245 to 255 is clipped. Um, and I'm okay with that based on what I am looking at in the image. I look at my histogram, I look at the colors. I don't just bring it all the way over because I can. I bring it over in as far as I feel like I need it. And by looking at the histogram, you'll notice it gives you your RGB values. Blue is ending over here. Red does spike at the end, but most of it's back that way. Same thing with green. I'm not clipping a ton of information. It's a creative project. I can go what way I want with that. Um, I also, because again, as I mentioned, uh, these two images at night, the colors, uh, I wanted it to be more contrasty, more saturated. So again, I chose punch as my clarity method, pushed it to about 20 to, to give it a little bit more impact. So you'll see where it was without and now with. So you get those blacks become much more heavier, much more dense. And the whites are going to start going a little bit closer to, to uh, clipped as well. So the brights are brighter, blacks are blacker, and it gives it that real harder edge feeling. So that's what I've done just on the background level alone. Uh, next thing I wanted to do um, was the sky. Now, this was definitely done with a gradient tool which is strange that when I push the gradient tool, it disappears. What ha can happen sometimes with older images is you sometimes lose a little bit of mask info, or I tried to add it back or change it, and I had to rasterize this mask. So for our purposes today, I'm actually going to clear this mask, get rid of it, and I'm going to just draw in a new gradient so we can control that. So I'm actually going to make it a little bit heavier at the top, maybe move it back just a little bit up because I don't necessarily want it touching either the top of this ride or those telephone poles too much. Um, definitely want that fall off to be less. I want it to be a little bit more dramatic. Um, so now I have that. Maybe that's too much now. Maybe because I made it so much heavier up top, I need to drop my opacity down on it a little bit to take some of that back out because it feels unrealistic. It all really kind of depends on your feeling. Um, I also decided uh, that ticket sign really needed to be a lot brighter and pop. I didn't want it to feel dingy. I wanted that to feel bright, inviting, kind of welcome you into the image. So I just drew a really quick mask on that square itself. Um, and in I, what I could have done is I could have done a luminance range on it and it would have selected instead just the white and not the red. But because I wanted the red to also brighten up and take some effect from the extra saturation, 
I did the whole thing as just a little quick square. Um, and that takes, you know, all of, uh, of, of two seconds to do. Uh, I'm going to clear the mask. I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to show you how we do that really fast. So I'll just brush it in. And actually what I'm going to do is I am going to make this mat, uh, my brush really small so I can get into those edges. Nice. And uh, let me actually toggle my mask on. So you see, I've got my point in the corner and this is how I will typically do it. If I shift click, I can draw a straight line. Same way as I could if I were in Photoshop or something. So I can just shift click around, draw a straight line. And then if I wanted to fill that center, I could either brush it in or I can just come to the, the radio buttons up here, which bring up all a lot of other options and click fill mask. And it's just gonna fill in the center of that section. So now I bring up my exposure 0.87. I give it some more contrast. You know, so it brightens out. And then I brought my black values down because without it, it was starting to feel a little flat. Not a ton flat, but a little flat. I can also, if I want it to feel even punchier, I can start to, to really add in some micro contrast. There's not as much going on and I'm getting some of that weird coloration that's happening with this old sign and the enamel chipping off. Uh, if, if I don't want that to be revealed, Maybe I dial that down. If I do want that to be part of the aesthetic, you will notice that that's starting to go a little blue. So what I could also do here is um, because it's blue, uh, it's all on the same um, layer, I could change the color temperature, the white balance itself, or I could come down to my, my uh, wheels, my color balance wheels, and uh, just kind of grab the color and put it in the direction that maybe I need it or want it to be. So it feels very blue and heavy. If I start to rotate it around, I can make it more yellow. The further away from the center you get, the higher the saturation change in that color goes. So you'll notice if I want it to be really blue, I just start to pull it all the way to the edge of the blue. Same thing, if I want it to be more magenta, I start to slide around that way. But I want it a, just a little warmer, just a little bit. So I'm going to pull the circle from the center into the yellow, I can change its saturation level. So what you'll actually notice here is this is the saturation level slider. So close to the bottom is it's gonna be in the center. Well, at the bottom is the center and further is out towards the end. So that controls your saturation level. You can also control uh, lightness. So I can make it darker or brighter there as well, just on that color change alone. Um, so I have some options with the color balance tool. <clears throat> Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Uh, there's the safety and guideline uh, uh, plaque also is kind of neat. I also wanted that to pop. But what I found when I tried to do it, if I did both the uh, tickets as well as the safety, uh, they weren't on the same values to get the right look that I was going for for this. So I created, again, just a separate um, mask doing the same thing, just four points in each corner, holding shift between each one, and then filled the mask and came back over to uh, this, and I brightened it a little bit. I changed my contrast values, and um, that's about it. I think I, up, I gave it a little bit more clarity, but this time instead of using punch, because if I used punch here, that sign feels a bit heavier maybe than I wanted it. Natural is gonna be give contrast, but less forceful, less, less contrast, less saturation change, and it preserves your darks and your highlights a little bit better. Uh, so I made those changes here uh, to that. Um, now that I'm looking at the image overall, I've made some of my changes. I feel like this bright corner is um, pretty distracting, right? Um, so what I want to do is change that. What I did here, this started life as a luminance value, um, a luminance value slider, and then I edited it and had to rasterize it uh, to change it. So, but maybe we'll get away with this time and not have to, um, because I wanted everything painted in. Uh, so I'm actually going to clear my mask, and now I'm going to just fill the whole thing push luminance range. And now I'm going to change my slider. I got to click the display mask button so I can actually see the controls on it. 
and I can kind of pick and choose where I need to be uh, with this. So I kind of want to be about here-ish. So I've got that corner uh, punched in, and this is what I have. I want to um, take some of this out because I don't want my sky to be um, affected here, and I don't necessarily want this building. I just want to work on this. Hang on, I'm trying to make my brush bigger. There we go. Uh, the same bracket keys that you use in Photoshop to make your brush bigger or smaller uh, work here in Capture One. So that's a nice refreshing thing. Uh, you don't have to learn new keyboard shortcuts on that. So I'm just editing these, uh, erasing this section out right now. Take all of this out because I don't want to make changes to these bits. I like that blue tone that's on the front of this. I like the yellow tones that are in... Um, in the tip top itself. So now what I would do here is um, it has got, let's see, do we have any changes saved here? We do not. Um, what I actually did with this one is I did use the advanced color editor. So you'll see it's um, it's brighter, a little bit more yellow and little bit more green here. Uh, so what I did is I chose a sample point. Let me actually, I'm going to reset it. I did it. Just once. I'm just trying to make a mental note of what I made changes to. All right, cool. So I'm going to pick my color point. Advanced color editor is neat. If you haven't used it, it's my favorite way to uh, minutely change colors and adjust colors. Uh, so while we have a couple of different tools for this, uh, there's the basic color editor, which is going to globally affect all the other colors. I can pin, I can just grab, say I wanted to affect teal or orange or yellow or blue, you know, and just tweak those. I could, uh, but it affects everything and it's at a global scale. It's across the whole image. I typically don't use the basic color editor. Uh, I tend to use the advanced a lot. I will pick my source point of the color I want to work on. I then make sure that I scroll down to the bottom section here and I expand my saturation range. So that means my slice of the pie goes all the way to the center. So I have all of that saturation range uh, addressed. <clears throat> and now one of the things that I can do here is I can view my selected color range. So when I toggle this on and off, it shows me all of the colors. So if I were doing this on the background layer right now, and I had chose this point and wanted to just change the pavement down here, I would also be affecting this yellow and this blue and these reds and oranges. But because I drew a mask, it is only actually going to um, affect the areas that are currently masked in. So that lets me know that I am still going to be working on the points that I want. So I want to dial this a little bit less green and want it to be uh, maybe a little bit closer to yellow orange. Um, so I would take my hue slider and I would start to go uh, down a little bit. I also think it's a little too saturated. It's a little too much information coming in. So I'm going to pull some saturation out. It feels better to me this way. It feels a little bit, uh, a little bit more balanced because I don't want the boring pavement to be so bright. I want to kind of take that down. I can also darken it up a little bit by pulling the lightness slider. Uh, keep in mind with the hue slider, I can change colors using this tool, but it only goes 30 degrees of the entire color wheel in either direction. So sliding it to the left is going to go clockwise. Sliding it to the right goes counterclockwise around the circle. Um, the reason it only does 30 degrees at a time of the circle is because if you were able to slide the entire 360 degrees, that, um, that slider would need to be massively large or you wouldn't be able to pinpoint it. Um, so if you want to fully flip a color, you can, uh, but you would have to start, um, sample, uh, clicking the same sample point each time expanding the saturation range, 
sliding it 30 degrees. It's absolutely doable. I've had friends as digital techs do it on set as a proof of concept. Hey, yes, that can be color corrected to this color. This is what it looks like. Um, because, you know, the art director said, do we really need to shoot this? They've done that kind of thing. Um, so you have that ability. Um, so I don't need that to be 30, but I want this to be just rotated a little bit. Uh, I definitely want to take a little bit more saturation out. I feel like it's maybe a little bit too much. Um, and I can, I can play with the lightness. Maybe I took too much saturation out here. Uh, so you have that ability to start working with those items. And again, you'll notice because I did a luminance range, this is here. I can actually push the luminance tool again and either expand this, change this, I can change the radius, whatever, and it'll, it'll dynamically affect and change as we go. So I can make fine tune uh, adjustments uh, as we go. It's not like I'm locked in with that anymore. Uh, the ride center starts to feel a little bit hot because obviously we're night exposure, it's long. Uh, there's bright things they are gonna overexpose really quickly. It's that fine tune balance. So um, this is what I've got with where I am now. Brightening the whole exposure made it a little bit too much. So I wanna focus specifically on that one. Uh, again here, I just took the brush and hand painted it in. I also could have done a luminance value here, um, but for the sake of time, I want to keep going. I see that we're losing a couple people because we've been at this about an hour now. Um, I will get to your questions, but uh, let's just kind of work through this just a little bit more and then we'll jump into those. Uh, so here, again, it's just real quick, quick simple uh, edits. Um, so for this, I wanted to make that feel uh, a little bit more punchy, a little bit more saturated because that, that raising of the... Um, that raising of the base exposure on the background started to make this feel flat. So with the center, um, I pulled my contrast value way up, uh, you know, 22 points of contrast, a whole lot of saturation because I feel like the whole spinning colorful power of this is what builds this, uh, this out. Um, maybe I shouldn't have done six seconds exposure here. Uh, maybe I should have changed it up so I could have maybe got a little bit more of the actual physical uh, seats for the rides. Uh, but you know, it is what it is. Um, I pulled down my highlight. I brought my shadow down because I really wanted to bring those shadow values back up. And I really bottomed out the blacks because I wanted those blacks to be noticeable there and define all those lines. Um, I also, uh, took my punch and, and drag that way up as well. So, uh, that's what punch netted for me. a bunch of saturation and it actually starts to bring in the ride operator a little bit there in the center, which is interesting. Um, this is what high dynamic range yielded for me. It brings in uh, more details and information and really kind of helps flesh out that black. And then the exposure here, subtle, but definitely there and helpful. And then the last thing that I did was I did a minuscule tweak to some of the, uh, the, the, the contrast values here. I brightened it a little, I did saturation, and I, uh, I brought the blacks down. And I actually didn't add any punch to this because I wasn't brightening it, I was just darkening it. So it takes me to a, a nicer level and gives me an image that is definitely uh, leaps and bounds, better, more interesting, and more aesthetically pleasing uh, than what we started off with, which is the whole point of ed editing your images. All right, so uh, that said, if you've got questions, send them over through the q and I'm gonna jump on these right now. Uh, Andrea asks, I wonder how much easier would it have been to achieve the final result while capturing the two images with double exposure plus, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Andrea, you are probably right. So Andrea brings up an interesting point. Uh, the new um, the new IQ4 150 digital back has dual exposure as, uh, as well as frame averaging technologies built in. If I had had those tools uh, for this, I probably would have had less post-processing uh, or, or at least less, less uh, needs for layers and things because I would have had extended dynamic range. So it's, it's a, if you wanna go back to our YouTube page, we actually have a whole discussion on frame averaging and dual exposure in the new digital back, how it works and how it benefits your image. 
Uh, it's really an interesting technology. It certainly would have helped some of this, Andrea, but I am curious what exactly would have happened uh, here uh, with the moving parts because we are relying heavily on the electronic shutter in that. Um, so without testing that, I'm not 100% sure, but some of it definitely would have been helped for sure. All right, let's see here. Mike asks, how would I output all layers along with the raw file to send to someone else so they can edit it? It's a great question, Mike. Uh, in order for someone to edit this image with all of the files, they have to use Capture One. You can't send the raw file with all of these layers and color information to somebody to work on in Photoshop. It'll never happen. Uh, they don't speak the same languages. They have different processing engines. However, as long as they are using Capture One, all I need to do is come over to my image, control click or right click on it, and this third section down says pack as EIP. What this is, is, is Capture One's proprietary zip technology. It's based on a zip structure, there's no compression, and it takes all of your settings and preview files and packages them into the raw file. So now when I go to Finder, and uh, let's see here if I go to where do my files live, my pictures folder, my Capture One sessions, find this digital darkroom series, And then if I find this file, which is called, hang on, bear with me, Sylvan Beach uh, underscore 59. So Sylvan Beach underscore 59, you will notice that it's file uh, extension, instead of being IIQ, which is a phase one native raw file, it is now .eip. If I grab this file, we transfer it, put it on a thumb drive, Google Docs, whatever, wherever you put it, however you send it, as long as it's big enough to handle a 100 meg file, uh, they will have everything when they download it. They just have to be on the same processing engine as you. So if you're on Capture 120, they have to be on Capture 120. If you're on 12 and they're on 10, they're not gonna be able to open it and work on it. If you're on 12 and they're on 20, no problem, totally will work. <clears throat> All right, so that answers that question. Uh, Chrissy says, no question, but thank you for this awesome tutorial. You are very welcome. I love this stuff. Um, I guess if there are no other questions, I'm going to actually flip back to this really quick and, um, just bring this up. Uh, if you need support on Capture One, uh, you can go to captureone.com. I highly recommend going to, when you download a new version of their software, downloading the release notes, because it always tells you or at least checking out the release notes. They don't have them available for download anymore. Highly recommend reaching out to their tech support and telling them to make it downloadable. Um, release notes are important. It gives you all the bug fixes, known issues, new features, supported cameras, supported lenses, lens profiles, all that stuff. Um, you can always contact support at photocare.com. While I'm not at the store, I am monitoring that inbox. Um, we also sell Capture One, so if you need a license, I can make that happen for you remotely. Um, and then, uh, we have a couple more webinars next week. Uh, the first thing that we've got next week is our uh, Nanlite new LED products for home solution. That's Tuesday, May 19th at 3 p.m. Manny Tejeda, who's been helping out in the comments section, is going to be uh, leading that one. Um, and then on Thursday, May 21st, uh, sneak peek, there's a new version of Capture 120 coming out. It's an incremental update, so you don't have to pay anything for it. There's going to be some new tools and features, and I am going to go over all of them for you on Thursday, May 21st at 2 p.m. And uh, Blake Griffith, the U.S. Capture One sales uh, representative, is actually going to be on that webinar with me. We'll talk about what's new. Uh, there's definitely some interesting things in there that I am kind of jazzed about. And then uh, the following week, what we've got on the calendar thus far is uh, Tether Tools product feature with Digital Tech and Tether Tools ambassador Rich Myers. Manny Tejeda will also be hosting that one. Definitely make sure you go to photocare.com to our events page though. We will be adding new things as we go. Uh, and these are always subject to change, but I re we really appreciate you spending some time with us today to learn some new things. Uh, these times are weird, and uh, we're glad that you could all come together with us today. I want to thank Manny Tejeda, John Schlesinger for helping out in the comments uh, with, with questions and whatnot. 
uh, John Kosha, store general manager for helping facilitate all this behind the scenes, Armelis Dalorville, who is doing all of our social media, and you know, obviously Jeff Hirsch and everybody else at the photo care team. Uh, we want to thank you. Stay safe, stay, stay healthy, and uh, we hope to see you back on uh, the next one. Thank you so much for coming. Bye, everybody.